Um, okay. So let's go to the RNSC experimental design and analysis. And as I told you, even if at some point you realize, well, you know, this RNSC analysis is not for me, okay? I have been teaching this for almost eight years. And some people after the class, after three days of class or, of several sections or even one month, depending how we uh, have organized these classes, came to me and said, you know, I understand that my informatician have to exist. I'm not going to be one of them. So even if at some point you fall on the on the that that category, okay? I hope not, but still, if you fall under that category, don't worry because it's, it's okay. No, not everyone knows to do everything. No, this is normal. I'm a complete and absolute disaster doing uh, PCRs. So, uh, but still, this important conceptual framework is something that I really encourage you to get, okay? Because even if you ask someone else to do the, the, the experiment for you, you still need to understand how the design was done, okay? So, let's go to this. Uh, so, this is going to be the presentation now. So, first, I'm going to give you a general overview of the RNA seq experiment, then, considerations that you should have for the experimental design. Then reference guide versus transcriptome assemblies, what, what you should do if you don't have a reference. High heterozygosity and polyploid problems. It's not much of a problem for humans. So you are working with humans, you may not have problems with that, but for plants, it's a huge problem. Tissue selections and treatments, how you will handle with those. RNA, RNA extraction and liver preparation, I would like to talk a little bit about that too. And then sequencing. No? So, so all these things that you need to take in, in mind for uh, trying to do the, your design. So let's start with uh, this general overview of the RNA seq experiment. So this is how a RNA seq experiment should be done. Okay, all the different steps that you have in mind or you should have in mind. So first, you need to have, a, of course, a question and a hypothesis. Okay, the question could be something as simple as. Um, uh, what are the mechanisms of root growth under soil stress? Okay. And then the hypothesis may be something like uh, transporters. Uh, certain transporters are going to be uh, induced in order to keep uh, the response to soil stress. So that would be the hypothesis. So once you have the question and the hypothesis, and that is essential, because in some ways it's going to tell you what you need to look into. So it seems so. So it may look like it's not important, but it's essential. Because depending on your question and your hypothesis, your data analysis need to be done in one way or another. Because at the end, the data analysis need to find as many things as you can to prove, to accept, or to reject your hypothesis. Of course, you can do a descriptive experiment. Let's, let's, let's look what is there in the transcriptome. But that will not be a good discussion. So you want to have a really solid discussion with your experiment. The first it's an essential part that you need to start with is with the question and the hypothesis of your experiment. OK, and, and some of my PhD students know that I'm kind of a very uh, pushy with that, and I always try to ask them to, to have good hypothesis because it takes time to have good hypothesis of work. But once you have a really good hypothesis, even if it's not true, even if you are going to prove that it's wrong, everything is much much more easy in terms of writing and analysis, okay? Okay, so once you have that hypothesis, you sit in front of a piece of paper and you start your design. And for that, I will give you all the considerations, okay, for that design, so we will go there. Once you have your design, you go to the sampling and RNA extraction. And sometimes it's a very easy process. Sometimes that involves that you need to optimize the RNA extraction because sometimes RNA extraction is not as an easy process. Once you have that, you prepare the libraries. And again, depending on your experimental design, the libraries can be prepared one way or another. We will go into that. Finally, you reach the point of sequencing. And again, it will depend on your experimental design. And just once you receive the sequence, this one start the analysis. The analysis can be divided in these processes that you can see here, okay, that are read processing that you will do today, read mapping that you will do uh, 
as an exercise for the next class. Um, quantification of the expression. Analysis of the differential expression. Once you know how much is expressed something, the question is, is it statistically different or not? Then uh, quality control assessment. So let's, let's look if from one to four, everything makes sense. And then once you mm, answer the question, yeah, quality is good, you do the explorative data mining. And the explorative data mining can be divided in four parts. One of them is anomaly detection. Sometimes you have things that are on, on the top, on the rockets, and so that is important because that can give you some, some, some interesting information about your experiment. Then clustering, then classification, and then the summarization of everything. And then it's done, the experiment is done. Okay, that is why the paper, or why the dissertation. So that is everything that you should have in mind when you are thinking about an organistic experiment. And of course, most of the part of the practical part of this class is going to be about that analysis as well. Okay, so if we go into that, it will be something like this. You know, you, you have the raw data that you get from the sequencer, then you ask, have the samples multiplexed? More of the time, yes. So most of the time you are going to go to this part. If not, you need to do the multiplexing yourself. Then you will have these uh, fast uh, sequences that need to be preprocessed. So once you preprocess them, you will have them. And then you need to ask, you have a reference. If you don't have a reference, you may need to do an assembly to find a consensus. If you have a reference, you need to map them. You will have BAM files. And with the BAM files, you may have some expression tables. And from this expression table, you do the differential expression genes analysis and maybe gene cluster by expression. Sometimes you may want to do some population cluster, but that is a complete out of the scope of this course. Okay, so that will be kind of a pipeline about how you do the analysis. But again, we will go to those steps later. So application of next generation sequencing transcriptomics are very, very broad. Okay, you may want to have novel gene discovery from a species that has not been described before. You want to go for alternative splicing discovery because maybe it has not been described before. Maybe you have some hypothesis there. Genetic marker development maybe is a good way to capture some regions of a genome uh, that is very big. So, for example, you're working with the pine genome. Maybe it's better to go for transcriptomes. You may need want them to do a population analysis. And again, you have different populations, different individuals. Maybe do this transcriptomic analysis it may not be the best, but it still will fix the problem. Or you want to do this to do uh, non-coding, uh, non-coding uh, profiling and discovery, no? So non-coding RNA. So that will be another option. And then gene expression and uh, analysis. Oh yeah, multiplexed sample. Uh, let me go. Yeah, sorry. A multiplexed sample. Remember that you don't want to spend the whole uh, the whole run because a whole run in a sequencer is expensive. So multiplexing means that during the library preparation you attach a tag uh, sequence uh, the uh, sequence no so DNA fragments of four or five nucleotides that define from which sample come that that fragment. And then you mix all the fragments from different samples and then you sequence them. When you have the sequence, you are able to identify the sample from which this sequence comes from, just looking into the into this tag. Don't worry, because I think that I have a slide later on. So I, I will come back to that, that concept. Okay, so that is the general overview. Let's go to consideration for experimental design. And the first is you need to be you need to be really conscious that about the complexity of the biological systems. So complex systems create complex transcriptomes. No, that is can kind of look like a sentence that you can have in a in a mug in, in your lab. Okay. Complex systems create complex transcriptomes and give headaches. That will be the the subtitle for that, that map. So for example, now you have uh, different genomes like a coli or Arabidopsis italiana or rice or sapiens, 
you may have different number of genes. So you are looking for rice, you have almost 50,000 genes, 56,000 genes, but when you are looking for humans, we have between 20 and 25,000 genes, okay? So we know we don't have two or three, we have of the order of 10,000 at least. And that is without thinking in polyploids. Then you have the expression of those, and the expression of those produce the RNA, that is the, the thing that you are looking for. And then this RNA is translated to proteins, and then these proteins sit inside compounds. No? That will be kind of the general, the general flow. But then these are regulated, so you have some, some, some steps in which these steps are regulated, so you have the regulation of DNA to RNA with uh, promoters, and some epigenetic marks, and then when you have the RNA, they can be also regulated with microRNA, long known coding, alternative splicing, and so on. So you have another layer of complexity. And then when they are translated to proteins, also proteins can be regulated even if we are not looking to this part. But sometimes you have a feedback, okay? And this happens in space and time. That's happening in some specific tissue, in some specific developmental process. But that doesn't happen alone, but also happen in interaction with the environment, and with other organisms. So you keep all these things together, that will give you a transcriptome. So it depends in transcriptome now, depends on a lot of different things. So if I take, for example, your, your transcriptome, the transcriptome of your blood now, okay, who knows, we are going to find. Some of you are going to be relaxed, some of you are going to be very stressed, some of you is going to represent uh, uh, high levels of, of, of tiredness, you know, so some, I don't know if some of you will represent some, some levels of excitement, but again, the complex, the transcriptome will be very complex because it's not something that depends only on one condition. So it's something that you need to keep in mind. So more precise that you are going to be in your sampling, less variance that you are going to get and more easy that is going to be to identify your uh, problem. Okay, so that is the first thing. And let's start with things that you already know some of them, you may know, but you don't take into consideration until you sit to design the spread. And the first thing is that this, of course, this, obsolete, this model is kind of obsolete, but still some, some people don't, don't realize until they start to do the analysis. That is the model of one genome, one gene copy, one single mRNA. That is completely wrong, okay? That almost no, doesn't happen. Okay, and it's not one gene or one gene copy, one single mRNA. So, for example, you may be analyzing more than one genome. Let's start with you may have more than one genome. And you may have more than one genome because when you are isolating your species, it's impossible to get just one species. Okay? It's going to be impossible. So, maybe you have uh, problems to isolate a single species if you are working in the rhizosphere. So, maybe you are working with roots. And even if you don't sequence bacteria, because they don't have polyase, uh, you may be sequencing fungus. So that would be an ex a good example. Indeed, uh, yeah. So someone that I know, I don't want to say names, uh, when they sent me the, the data to analyze, 20% uh, of the data was a contamination of a fungus in the greenhouse. Okay? So that thing happened. Indeed, that would be a good... So in, indeed, maybe you want to have kind of a, a good sentence for your map, will be complex system, create complex transcriptome, and shit happens. No, that would be a good, a good way to start the experiment. So that, as I said, it's difficult to find just one species, so you need to be careful with that. And also, you have sometimes that your experimental design already has some interactions between uh, the, the species that you are working with. So you may have uh, some plant pathogen interactions, or maybe you are working in a human disease, so let's suppose that, for example, you are working with the coronavirus. Well, coronavirus, probably you are not going to get the RNA because it doesn't have polyase. But imagine that you are working with a fungus infection in humans. So if you take a human sample, you will be sequenced not only the human, but also the pathogen. So that is something that you will have a different uh, mRNA population. So that is the first thing. That is in terms of genomes. Then it's in terms of how many alleles you should expect per gene. Well, you need to keep in mind that a lot of organisms are polyploids or were on polyploids at some point, that you may have heterozygosity. 
So at least two alleles for diploids. And then that genes are not alone. I mean, you don't find one copy, but they have a complex evolutionary history. So you may have gene families or tandem duplications even. OK. So you are working with uh, plant defense genes or with immuno immunoglobulins in humans. They are commonly associated in tandem families, so you have several copies in the same genomic region. So it's just not working with one copy, and of course that produces a lot of complexity when you are mapping. And of course, one allele is not producing only one mRNA, because then you have alternative splicing. You may have different forms, so that is another layer of complexity that you need to take it into account. And don't worry, because a good experimental design will take out all these things and, and, and still you will be able to handle them. So if I'm just adding you problems, don't worry, because at the end you, I mean, the experimental design manage them, but you need to keep that in mind. Also, is if you are going to perform different time points, and that is a common experiment in, in any system, you need to keep in mind two things. One of them is how you can select the same experimental state, the same developmental state, that sometimes is difficult. In Arabidopsis, it's easy because you know that after fertilization, you have very, very well detailed, very well described processes, one day, two days, three days after fertilization. You're working with that in Arabidopsis, but you are working with tomatoes or with uh, avocados even. This is not just one day, but, um, but it has some variation there that sometimes it's difficult to know if you are in one stage at the end of one stage or entering in the new one. So, so that is complex. Also, the thing that you need to keep in mind is response to a treatment. So, so how do you know that your treatment is working? Okay. That would be another, another problem that you need to keep in mind. Also, you are looking to target some specific organ or even some specific tissue cell that is another issue. So when you are talking about cell types, you have three options to get different cell types in your experiment. And we are talking about sampling. One of them is used, for example, laser capture marker dissection. Another option is have marker lines with some fluorescence and then do some sorting that works quite well, or have single cell experiment. No matter in which experiment do you have, you are working in your mRNA population even if you are targeting some types of cell, you will have contaminations of others. Okay, so that is representing here. No? So even no, no matter what experimental you do, you still will have contaminations. Advantage, for example, of contamination for single cells is that still you know you can identify the cell that contains the contamination because this cell has their own mRNA. But otherwise, it can be sometimes complex. Other thing that I like to put always is individuals and replicates. And of course, these can be very different, very variable, depending on what you are working with. I mean, sometimes if you are working with humans, you cannot get as many individuals as you can see here, because if you have limitations in the experimental design, you need to go to a different one. But supposing that you can really have control about how many individuals do you want to test, my recommendation always is, if you are working with plants, let's say that you are, have plants control and then some treatment, like coal, at least you want to have three different plants per replicate, okay? Three for control, three from coal. For replicate one, three control and three coal for replicate two, and three control and three coal for replicate three. And these three should be independent, so you cannot, this one cannot be the same as this one. Okay, they should be independent plants. And that is in simplifying the experimental design. I always recommend not three, but at least five. And the reason is that if something happened to one of these plants, lower that is the number of plants that you have, more chances that you have that your transcriptome is not going to be representative, and then you are going to produce a variant. Meanwhile, if you have a big population, this kind of uh, individual events will be diluted into the whole transcriptome that you are extracting. So it's why you, it's, it's always important to have as much individuals as you can. Not that will be. And of course, you always, always, always 
have to have at least three replicates. If someone sent me two replicates, no, you need to have three replicates, okay? It's always essential to have two replicates. Two replicates is this kind of thing that I cannot, I have two replicates, I cannot do anything else. Things happen. But still, if you can have design, a design for three replicates, at least put three replicates. So when you have this experimental design, you need to have these considerations, no? You need, of course, first you have economical considerations, so you know how big is your budget. Then you need to have genomic considerations about the number of species, polyploids, and stereocygosity that you are going to handle. Biological considerations like organ tissue, cell type, uh, developmental cell, treatments, and so on. Or technical considerations like skill and hardware, okay, in your design. Maybe you are going to use just a piece of software because it's easy to use, not because it's the best. And sounds crazy that a lot of things that we do is because of that. Because sometimes the software is not so great, it's not so sensitive, sensitive, but for the experiment it's fine. And for sure it's much more easy that to use than the sensitive one. Okay. So that sometimes is an important consideration. Then you need to keep in mind controls and replicates. Okay, so your experimental design. And then you need to evaluate what technology are you going to use, how you are going to prepare the libraries, what is the sequencing amount that you need, and finally, what is the pipeline that you are going to select for your analysis. Okay, so all these considerations that you can see here is, are a part of the experimental design. And let me tell you, a good experimental design is going to save you a lot of headaches. Because once you have a bad experimental design and you do your experiment, uh, yeah, you cannot do anything else. Let me put you, uh, I always like to put this uh, example of uh, a bad experimental design that happened to me when I was, at the beginning of my career when I was working as a bioinformatician. I was collaborating with someone in the Netherlands and they want to sequence um, they want us to sequence different landscape tombs of uh, an invasive species that is called Solanum dulcamara. So, well, not was a landscape tomb, it was a small portion of the genome, I think. It was a landscape tomb. No, I think it was a landscape tomb, yeah. Okay, anyway, they sent me the samples for the analysis. And then at some point, I was looking for the vari variation that you could find there. No? And I found a huge variation. No? When I was looking for the number of alleles per gene, I found something like 16 different alleles per gene. No? It was just completely crazy. So at some point, I said, well, come on, but this is a Solano. So I, I, well, maybe it's an octoploid. No? But it doesn't ring me up that it's an octoploid. So I contacted these guys and said, well, you know, what, what did, you, did you send me? Well, we send you the samples of, of this Solano dulcama. I said, oh, well, perfect. Um, do you know if your species is a polyploid? No, no, it's a diploid. Okay, so why I have 16 alleles by average per gene, sometimes even more? So, ah, well, that probably is because we mix uh, different accessions. Well, what? Yeah, that we mix different accessions. So we talk uh, different varieties of Solanum dulcamara that we have in our greenhouse. We mix all the RNA together and we sequence, but you are by informatician, no? So you are going to be able to go back uh, and look into the sequence, tell us from which variety is the sequence, no? Of course not. Of course you cannot do that. You don't tag them before you do the libraries. You don't put this piece of information in the, in the multiplexing. It's completely impossible that you are going to identify from which accession do they have. By the way, they make something like 40 different accessions, okay? So it was a kind of a nightmare. Okay, so that's an example that a bad experimental design completely throw away an experiment. Okay, so that is the experimental design. Question that you may have about these global considerations. No questions? Are you still there? Yes. 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 
Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let me continue uh, with that. By the way, if you think that I should reduce the number of jokes during the presentation or increase it to do these things more relaxed, just let me know, okay? I can change that settings too, okay? Um, by the way, making jokes with uh, Teams and Zoom has been a complete disaster of my career as a comedian, okay? So it doesn't have the same, the same. Okay, um, let's go to the risk reference guide and transcriptome assemblies. Okay, more jokes. I will try to find those. Okay, so one part, so let's suppose that you already have the reads, okay? So I will already talk about the, all these considerations. So you put this in the sequencer and then you get the reads. So the first question that you need to ask, and this is something that you need to ask during the experimental design is reference. Do I have a reference for my transcriptome or do I don't have the reference? And if I have the reference, that could be a problem, no? One other thing that you need to do is you need to map to a reference in order to quantify the expression of genes. So the reference is a genomic sequence with the gene models that you are going to use to align the reads. Okay, but the reference also can be a de novo assembly transcriptome. So the most important use of the reference is for the analysis is that the analysis is going to be computationally less intense, no? And this is something that comes from a paper from a long time ago, but it's still we're comparing for 5.4 that you can completely ignore, but you can see Illumina. So when you are using Illumina and Bowtie, the amount of RAM and the time is going to be much less than when you need to do a de novo assembly, okay? And that can take even several days. So that is an important thing. So do I have a reference? Well, I don't know. So the first question that you need to do is, during the experimental design, is go to different portals and see if you have whole genome assemblies uh, in this portal. So you can go to NCBI genomes, or you can go, you work with plants, a good one is phytosome, or you work with animals also, ensemble genomes are a really good source of new genomes. So first you need to go to these places and check if your reference genome is there. Of course, if it's not there, one option is to sequence your reference, but that will take a long time. So that is out of the scope of this process, of course. Let's suppose that you find something similar that is not exactly your, the same accession of the same species. So you may have the question, you know, that can I use a reference, a different accession? And the answer is yes. You will lose a minimum amount of genes, but of course you can. That is a common practice. Can I use a reference a different species? That's a good question. If it's for the same genus, sometimes yes. But farther, that is the species, uh, more variance you are going to have, and more chances that you have to lose some of the transcripts. And of course, it's not the same to use for Solanum lycopersicum. It's not the same to use as a reference Solanum pimpinelli folium that is a close related species, than to use Solanum melogena eggplant that is very far and that have a distance of more or less uh, 15 million years ago. So same genus, again, it depends. Same family? No, probably not. Same families, they are very far apart. They are very different. And some reads will map with most of conserved genes, but not with all of them. So, so I will not recommend to use as a reference same family. Okay. This is an example also that I did long time ago. But I was curious to know what is the percentage of reads that map that you lose when you compare different accessions and then different uh, species or same family. So if you take Columbia reads, so, so you take Columbia, Arabius Italiana Columbia as a reference, and you map Columbia reads, you may get a mapping of between 75 and 99%. So the thing that you don't map probably is because there are contaminations. If you would to go for Lambert's or for another accession that is C24, the percentage of mapping is not going to be much different. So it's the same order, we'll be fine. For Abidopsis ligata, that is a different species, same genus, you get, get some reduction in the mapping, but still the number will be okay. Okay, will be around the same. 
So, so it still means that you can use Taliana as a reference for Lirata. But if you want to use Brassica Rapa, that is the same, same family, of course, this goes very low. So it's not recommended to map them, as you can see, 20%. Again, also, the, the, the time that they use also increased how, depending on how different and how many ways do you have. So that would be the representation of what I said before. OK, let's suppose that a closed reference is not a ballet. What is the thing that you should do? And it's why I'm starting to talk this before I talk the experiments or the libraries and so on, because you will need to find a reference. So if the reference is not available, you have two options, the cheap one and the expensive one. The expensive one is you can do long read sequencing with PacBio or Oxford Nanopore. Because these technologies sequence long reads, you may end it with long with full full transcripts. And that is wonderful because you don't need even to, to assemble them. You already have full transcripts. Okay. So that that is good because as a pro, it captures full length transcripts and no assembly is required. So that simplifies the process a lot. The cons, the con um, is that it may be expensive. That is the first problem. The second problem is that in in order to capture a good representation of the whole transcript term, you really need to sequence a lot because the one that had not a lot of uh, reads, well, a lot of uh, molecules in your population may not be represented or may not be represented by chance. So that could be expensive if you want to hit a good representation of your transcript term. And you have several transcript terms, again, it's a problem. No? You imagine that you are working with a, 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 a a treatment, no? you have your plan and your plan under solid stress. What you should use for reference, the control or the solid stress? If you use the control, you may lose some transcripts from your solid stress that you wanted. Maybe you can mix them equal, equal morally to create this, this record. So that would be another option. But again, bring you some, some questions on the table. If you don't have the money because that time, sometimes are expensive, you can just do perform a transcriptome assembly with Trinity, sub the novel trans or abyss trans that are programs to assemble transcriptomes. Advantage is cost effective. The disadvantage is that when you are doing genome assemblies, you may have a lot of different problems. So you have several complications associated with sequence assembly like chimeras. You may miss low represented transcripts. You may collapse homologous in polyploids, so you might have a very long list of problems. Okay. So still, it's not an easy solution. OK, questions that you have uh, about that part? Uh, yes, I haven't understand the time column of the of the table. Why the, the time is different for different genome? Well, if it is one, it depends on the number of reads so you see, lower that is the number of reads, faster it's going to. Oh, OK, OK, OK. <laughs> that is one of the things. The other thing is that even if lower is, yeah, so more or less lower is, is faster. So then sometimes uh, you find that in this case, for example, you have less number of reads here than here, but still here is taking more time than here, and probably it's because you have more differences. So the main influence is how big is your data set. The second is how different. So that are the two main, main influences in the speed. Any other question? Yes, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not really into a uh, sequence um, to genomic bioinformatics, so uh, my questions might sound a bit stupid, but is it always uh, necessary to have um, a, a, ref a reference uh, sequence to to map your reads, or is it possible to construct the uh, to 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 have an output uh, without uh, um, building the uh, the without aligning to a uh, to a reference? Uh, I'm sure that you will lose some information uh, like uh, splicing variants, uh, for example. But is it still possible to get um, some some kind of useful output? No, no, okay. no. At this point. Uh, we need, uh, at this point, we need to map the reads to a reference to perform any transcriptomic analysis. In order to quantify 
the genes, you need to the trans the, the expression of the genes, you need to map to a reference. The thing is that sometimes if you don't have the reference, you need to build a reference yourself with your own data set. But you always need to uh, map to a reference. I'm not sure if there are some modern methodologies that may be using a different approach like k -mers. But yeah, I will say 99.99% of the time you will need to use a reference. You, yeah, you cannot not use it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. If you don't have any other question, I will move to high heterozygosity and polyplate problems. So, as you know, you mentioned before, you have more than one allele in most of the genomes, and also some of them can be polyplates. So, when you have an RNA from this species with high heterozygosity or a polyploid genome, you, you are going to produce uh, high polymorphic reads on the same gene. Because you may have some high polymorphic genes, and uh, when you are doing the mapping, the problem is that you may have a regular mapping and the gene expression is an average. Or when you are doing the NOVA assembly, you may collapse some, some alleles. And this will be an example, no? So if you have a reference for the gene one here, this is your reference, and then you map the reads, you may have for the allele A, okay, that you are mapping, for example, one read, but then for your allele B, you find three reads. So the expression of gene one will be A plus B, even if A and B are going to be different. So you will see the average. Or when you are trying to do genome assemblies, you have one, one read, and then you have another read. Well, sorry, for gene one, you have one read. For the gene B, you have three. When you do the assemblies, you are going to call the consensus. And this, you are going to call up the consensus. So the consensus will be the consensus of A plus B. So in this case, for example, you will miss some of the variants. So that is one of the first problems that you are going to find. But this is genes also, you have some regions in the genes that are more polymorphic than others. So this is going to be an irregular process. So when you are mapping, you are going to have some regions that are going to map okay. And you are going to have other regions that if the allele is different from the reference or too different from the reference, it may not be mapped as well. And this is a good example, no? So, so imagine that uh, we have a polymorphic region like this one, and then you have a non-polymorphic region, no? You have a gene one and gene two, no? These are two copies of the same gene. Imagine that you have two genes in a tandem, okay? Imagine that you have gene one and then gene two. They are the same, but they are different because there are two copies of the same gene in different places of the genome, two different loci. So when you map the reads, Okay, imagine that in total you have four weights. Okay, you have some polymorphisms. So imagine that you have in total one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, when you are mapping this, when you have the polymorphic region, you are going to map five and two. So that would be perfect. Okay, because you have the polymorphic. The polymorphic is telling you that this width going here and doesn't go here, and this width go here and doesn't go here. But then if you don't have polymorphics, and even if these reads from here should have the same proportion than here, because you don't have any polymorphisms, the thing that is going to happen is that they are going to map equally in both genes. And because they are going to map equally in both genes, you are going to modify what should be the expression, no? So in this case, you will have four and four. So if you sum two plus four will be six, and then five plus four will be nine. But the expression, should be 2 plus 2 equals 4, 5 plus 5 will equals 10. So you can see how these kind of effects will be producing these kind of, of, of errors, okay? One option that some programs do is that when reads can map equally in both places at the same time, they are going to be removed from uh, the account. But again, that will be a problem because in case of comparing one with gene two, will be perfect because you are going to remove the same amount of reads for this gene. But maybe you have a gene free that is not related with those and you don't remove any reads for gene free. You, when you are comparing gene free with this gene one and gene two, will have problems because you are removing reads from gene one and gene two. Okay, and but not from gene three. So that will be another bias. 
With polyploids, of course, when we are working with plants, plants are highly polyploids. You have uh, also some events of polyploidization and the history of these plants. So you are looking for bananas. You have, for example, uh, one, two, three, four, five in the last 150 million years of the banana uh, evolution. Or you are looking, for example, for a biopsy, you have three. OK, so you have a lot of different whole genome duplications that may produce distortion. So there are some, some ways to deal with that. No, uh, there are no simple solution when you are working with highly duplicated genomes, but long reads, longer that is the read, more chances that you have to minimize these problems. Uh, so you are interested in that is a nice publication and that also a good example about how the RNA seq pipelines change when you are using polyplots and what are the impacts that they can have. And of course, it's not only from the how much do you sequence, how long are the rigs, but also uh, uh, depending on the tool that you are using, they are much better, much worse with polyplots. Okay, so still there are a lot of uh, insights here. Okay, questions about high heterozygosity and polyploid. Yes, I don't know if uh, uh, so. I lost connection for a bit. I don't know if you uh, say something about that, said something about that. And uh, so, could be uh, using uh, as a reference, uh, for example, long reads, uh, Oxford Nanopore, or uh, I don't know, Pac Bio, right? Uh, <laughs> So a way to um, uh, to say decrease the probability to so if I have two different alleles, maybe I have two long reads with a uh, different uh, uh, allelic forms. So it could be a uh, I mean a pro. This is one. By using a reference as a reference, the long reads. Yeah, yeah, indeed you can. I mean, one solution is to use uh, long reads from Oxford Nanopore. Uh, that will fix the problem. As I, as I said, that will fix some part of the problem. But this reads has a lot of errors. Sometimes the amount of errors that you have inside the read is higher than the variation that you have between the copies, and then you cannot do. Still, you have that limitation for the mapping. So imagine that imagine that you have, let's say, uh, the the two copies that you have problems with have five uh, nucleotides changes in one hand. That is five percent. That is quite high. But Oxford nanopore have also five percent of errors. So you will have the same amount of errors in your reads of Oxford nanopore. That's in the in the in the different alleles. So at the end, the program doesn't know if it's a problem of the errors. It's a problem, you know. Yeah, of, yeah. Okay, I understand. Yeah. So, so it's a solution, but it's not the perfect solution. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, it's. Uh, okay. Oh no, no, it's fine. It's fine. okay. So I'm going to move to tissue selection and treatments. Um, so some things that are interesting here, no. So when you are thinking about tissue, tissue selection and treatment, different organs, tissue, or cell types can produce uh, different mRNA extraction yields. OK, so that is the first problem. When you are comparing pollen RNA with uh, ovule RNA, you may have some, some limitations about the yield that you get extracting the mRNA. Also, sometimes you have some samples that may have some low yield. So when you have samples that have low yield, a common practice is to, to do the thing that is called uh, amplification, cDNA amplification. So you can introduce cDNA amplification in order to amplify the signal. You may lose some of the low represented genes, but still you will have a good signal for the rest. So it's a common practice when you are doing laser capture microdissection. And sometimes also when you are doing uh, cell sorting. So the problem, so the thing is, amplification will will produce some several bias, some severe, severe bias between low and high represented transcripts. 
so you can still do it, but if you do it first, you need to apply this to all the samples that you have. Even if your other samples doesn't need amplification round, you have to apply them in order to have the same amount of bias for all the samples. Otherwise, they cannot be compared. So again, if you need to do some amplification for your pollen sample, but not for your leaf sample. They are not going to be compared. You do for one and not for the other. So you need to do the amplification also for the leaf sample. And the other is to use some software to measure and correct this bias, like sick bias that is a package from our bioconductor. So that would be a good practice. Also, remember that if you are going to sequence uh, several samples, you need to use mul the multiple multiplexing. Someone asked me that before, Dana. So that is the thing. Remember, if you have a control and a treatment, you can start the mRNA. You can put a tag when you are building the libraries, and then you mix them before you send for the sequencing. Then once you have the sequence, you can separate them. OK, so that will be another thing for the tissue selection and the treatments. For the tissue selection also, if you are doing a treatment, it's always great to have controls that you can use to assess that the treatment was effective before you perform the rna seq experiment. And sounds intuitive, but I know a lot of people that they don't do it. So for example, I know people that they are doing some uh, pathogen, some infections to the, 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 the experiment, the, the, the individuals, and they do the RNA seq. And then when you ask, well, by the way, do, did you check that your plants were infected? So, oh yeah, they look infected. No, no, but they don't look, even if they don't look, they look infected, you need to have a more accurate way to predict if the plant was infected, especially related with the landscape plant. So for example, you are producing infections in, in Arabidopsis. One would, way that you can do is after that you do the, the treatment and you have the RNA, RNA, you can do some quality PCR with pathogen related genes like PR1 or PBF1, and then check you have the induction of these genes under the treatment. You know? So it could be uh, an infection in this case, in the figure that I put here is under uh, jasmonate. That's, they should be induced. OK, so that is important before you send them for the sequencing. And that is for uh, treatments. Let me finish that this, because, as I said, because I need to stop at four. So RNA extraction and library preparation. So this part is important that remember that the selection of the method of extraction uh, will be driven by the type of the experiment. Sometimes, depending, you, not all the RNA method works. You need to evaluate the RNA concentration, integrity, and purity. You need to have the depletion methodology, so think how you are going to do that, and how you are going to prepare the libraries. Three and four, sometimes it's things that usually the, the sequencing company that you send your samples is going to take care. So you don't need to be worried about these two. But still, you need to know about them. All these things is going to influence your experiment. So for example, the selection of the method is, uh, of the extraction. So first, my recommendation is to perform a bibliographical search because the quality of, of their RNA extraction for a, a, an RT that you use commonly in the lab may not be sufficient in terms of quality, okay? This things about, oh yeah, I have been extracting RNA a lot to, um, for quarto PCRs that I do in Arabidopsis, so I don't need to find a new method because this method works to extract RNA in May but you may not have the quality that is required for an rna experiment. Use kits when they're available. So I always recommend kits than an uh, in-house method because they're more reliable. Uh, but sometimes they might not be adequate for some recalcitrant tissues. So sometimes when you are trying to look for uh, extracting RNA, for example, from bark or from some uh, archaeological remains, it may not work. And also estimate if the method that you are going to use, the kit, is going to produce enough gel. The gel is going to be enough to produce enough, the enough RNA that you need, not only for, for the libraries, but also for the other steps that you may need to do. As I said, if you need to run a QRT-PCR to check if the treatment was effective, check if this will work, okay? Because of course, you may need to have more than one extraction. If you need to do more than one extraction, my, in order to have enough 
amount of DNA, my, my, my suggestion always will be to mix them, okay? To create pools by replicates, not between replicates. Okay, once you have the RNA, you need to evaluate that if it's okay for, uh, for the library. So you need to evaluate concentration, purity, and integrity. You need to evaluate the three of them. For the concentration, you can use uh, a qubit. So we have a qubit in the lab. Okay, I think that there are two qubits in the department of bioscience, so you can use any of them. Then you need to evaluate the purity. So the purity is how many concentration, how many proteins or other uh, molecules of other things that are not RNA may be in solution. So in order to do that, it's always good to measure the ratio between 260 and 280 and should be bigger than 1.8. Okay. So that is can be done with a simple nanoglobe. Don't use nanoglobes to measure concentration, okay? Because nanoglobes are very uh, inaccurate to measure concentration with precision. You need to use qubits. And then for the integrity, you need to do, use a DNA fragment analyzer. There are several ones. Uh, and the ring value, that is the ratio between uh, the two, the two ribosomes RNA before you deplete them, need to be eight or more. Okay, so that is also an important thing. We have a fra DNA fragment analyzer also in the department. Okay, so you need to use one of them. There is one of them there. And you are interested in the ring values, uh, please check this publication. Okay, that is give you a really good reasoning about uh, why it's a good method to evaluate integrity. Oh, other thing is when you are looking integrity here, you will see also you have genomic DNA. You should not have genomic DNA. Okay, one common thing that you do is to treat the RNA at the end of the extraction with DNA in order to remove the DNA. The depletion methodology depends on what the thing that you are looking for. Most of the time, you use poly-A selection. So when you are doing the libraries, you just use a poly-A primer, poly-T primer. So you are going to transcribe only poly-A. But may not be the case for you, because maybe you are looking for, you are working with bacteria, that their transcript doesn't have poly -A's, or maybe you want to look for other uh, RNA populations that doesn't have polyase. Okay, in that case you need to use this R RNA depletion. Okay, if you are more interested in the, here is a good uh, also uh, paper that describes gene quantification in clinical RNA sequencing using both depletion methods. And the final thing is the library preparation, and there are many different ways to prepare DNA libraries. RNA libraries. Some of them are more precise than others. So we have an in-house method in our lab that works sometimes, sometimes not, but it's cheap. Uh, sometimes it's not good, no? You know that I say, yeah, it's cheap. And then sometimes it works, sometimes not. I prefer kids, no? You can have kids, even if they are more expensive. I always recommend the kids because it's going to give you less headaches and you cannot have variants. Um, so, Mostly, even not important, what is the kit that you are using? It has three steps. First, you do the first time DNA synthesis, and you can use oligo DT, depending if you are have a, you are doing this poly A selection, or you can use random primers. Or you are can prime off oligos ligated to the end of the RNA. That some some of these methodologies use. No, I, I never use it, but some of the methodologies use this this approach. Okay, then you sequence the second stand of the DNA synthesis. And then you do the fragmentation of the cDNA. That is the free common practice with each of the different steps, but I'm not going to go into much detail. The last thing I want to mention is a note about slang specific libraries and slangless library. Slang specific libraries are important for the novel transcript assemblies and to identify true antisense transcripts. So if that part is important for you, yeah, go, go ahead with slang specific. When you have a reference genomes, and you are not studying antisense, it's fine. You can do a slam nest library. And the last thing that I can say is that some companies, no matter what do you ask, they do a slam 
specific libraries and you don't need to select, no, because it's more easy for them just to have one protocol than two. So at the end, if you can do it stand specific for the same price, yeah, let's do it. No, will save you a lot of problems. Okay. Last part, sequencing, and I will finish the class. And then if you have questions, you have to admit the question just after the break, okay? Because I need to go for this exam. For the sequencing, first question, how many reads do I need per sample? There have been several studies. The short answer is between 20 and 25 millions. You are, are working with a diploid genome. You are working with a polyploid. You may need to multiply that for your, for your ploid 11. Okay, so you are working with a polyploid. You need 40 million, between 40 and 50 million of clean reads, okay? Beyond that, you more or less have saturated the low expression task. So that, that is a good number. If you need to do a quantification of alternative splicing, multiply that per five or 10, okay? You will need between 100 and 200 millions of reads per, well, per sample I say, per replicate, okay? Per replicate. This, and, and as I said, this publication also tell you that at some point, no matter that you have more depth, you, you reach a point that you saturate the number of new uh, transcripts that you can detect. So it's why that is an optimal number. How long should be the reads? That will be another question. And again, depends on your design. Minimums. You are going to perform a de novo assembly or a reference with a whole genome duplication. My recommendation, long with, longer is always better, at least 100 base pairs, and always have Parents is recommended, as, as well as when you are doing alternative splicing. If your reference doesn't have any whole genome duplication, single reads, 50 base pairs, should be okay. If you have several limitations, well, there are some tools that doesn't work quite well with long reads, so you need to take that into account. And other tools doesn't work with color space produced by solid. So you are using solid that is a strange system. Not all the uh, tools are going to work. So more or less the thing that you need to uh, move will be something like this. So do you have a reference? Yes, Illumina single reads or parents, depending of, of how complex is your reference. If you don't have the reference, you have enough funds, use PacBio or Oxford Nanopore to create a reference and then Illumina for quantify. Or use, if you don't have enough funds, well, Illumina parents is the thing that you have, so let's move with that, okay? The last thing that I wanted to mention, and that thing that probably is better if I leave this uh, for after four, is that when you have the quality, so when you obtain the reads from the sequencer, you need to start to do some processing, okay? So, uh, but I will tell you about that later, okay? So let's do the break here. I will come back at uh, 4.45. So you have a long break of 45 minutes. So you can still work in the exercise if you want. You can go through the presentation and, and let me know if you have any other question when I come back. Oh, yeah, so, but yeah. So you will have uh, 45 minutes. So see you in 45 minutes. Thank you. Bye.